please stand if you're able for the reading of the Lord's word. How do you start? First Peter five, six through 14. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God, and thank you, Marie, for reading. Lord, be with us now in your spirit, by your spirit, and imprint your word onto our hearts. Let it come out of us this week in how we live. And I just pray that we would stand fast in our faith. Amen. I have a friend who I'll call Stan, um, who I met uh, through a church that Meg and I once attended. And he, he walked into our Thursday Bible study one week, and I instantly liked him. As he became part of the church family, I got to know him more. He was a thoughtful and kind and loving man with a mature faith. Um, he was committed to serving the poor and living out his faith in that way. In fact, he had moved to the city where we lived just to teach in an underfunded school. Um, Stan was someone who, who I even looked up to and uh, uh, was an example of many of the qualities that I sought in my life. And yet, as I've been on, uh, in touch with Stan over Facebook for the last many, several years, um, I've noticed that Stan undergone what he calls a deconstruction of his faith. He has questioned and rejected many of the doctrines and uh, parts of the Bible he once believed, and, and now, in fact, doesn't even call himself a Christian. And I wish that Stan's story were uncommon, but it's not. Um, Meg and I, in fact, have many friends from the years, people that we have prayed with, studied the Bible with, gone on missions with, worshipped with, who have since walked away from Jesus or the historic Christian faith. Kids that we went to Sunday school with and youth group with have, have chosen paths in life that don't include following Jesus. And when I, I think about Stan or others who have lost their faith, I feel sobered. I think, there but for the grace of God go I. Many of you have people close to you who are in this same category. Maybe a, a child, a, a son, a daughter, a grandchild, a, uh, a close spouse. Someone who, had, who you've seen um, walk away from Jesus, either drifting little by little or turning their back on him. And I know that many of you yourselves have, have been close to doing that or maybe have done that for seasons of your life. I know there have been times when I've said, Lord, I'm not sure if I can continue this. I, is this really true? Is this really worth it? The truth is we are all a lot more vulnerable than we think to losing our faith, to walking away from Jesus. Now, we could debate whether or not a person can actually lose their salvation, but Peter has strong words encouraging, urging us to stand firm in the faith. 
That's how he ends this letter that we've been looking at for the last several months. Stand firm in the faith. That's his final uh, pastoral plea and exhortation to these churches. Stand fast. Stand firm in the faith. And so that's what I want to preach to you today. And whether you're feeling stronger than ever, or whether your faith is hanging by a thread this morning, or somewhere in between, this is a message we all need to hear. Stand firm in the faith. And I'm going to break down what Peter says into two categories. First, what we need to do to stay faithful. And second, where we get the power to do. So first, what we must do, and second, how we can actually get the power to do that. First, what must we do to be faithful? The first thing Peter says in verse 6 is to stay humble in hardship. Stay humble in hardship. A common denominator that I've seen in people walking away from Christ is going through difficult things and saying, God, where were you? How could you let me down like this? Maybe you're in a place like that now. And those feelings are natural. I'd be lying to say we, we, don't, we shouldn't have those at the point. The point is, if we let those things build up and build up and build up, it's a load that we cannot bear. It's a load that will break our faith. And a huge part of Peter's message, you may remember, has been, don't be surprised by suffering. Don't be surprised when bad things happen, as if God is you know, letting something strange happen to you. Expect it. And in accept what God brings. And here we see the same thought echoed, where Peter says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Peter is saying, humbly accept the hardships that God allows in your life. And instead of shaking your fist at the sky, open your hands in acceptance and trust. Trust that he will lift you up in due time, at the right time. There is a day when all wrongs will be righted. Disappointments will be, um, will be filled in with God's love. And the challenge that he gives us comes with this wonderful attendant promise. He says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The Greek is something like, Load your anxieties on him. Load your anxieties on him. You know that load that's hard for us to bear, those questions and doubts and, and stress. We can unload that from ourselves and load it onto the shoulders of our God who cares for us. Pastor uh, Sam Alberry says it this way about trusting God. He says, God knows better than you do. God loves you more than you do. God is more committed to your ultimate joy than you are. So trust him. Trust him. That's the first thing we must do is to, is to be humble, uh, humble in hardship, to stand firm in our faith. Well, another common denominator that I've seen in people losing their faith is Satan's work, the devil's work. In February 2019, a young man um, in his early 30s was going for a run on a trail in Colorado. And as he jogged along completely alone out in the wilderness, out on this trail, he heard a rustling sound behind him. And he turned around just in time to see a 70-pound mountain lion lunging through the air straight at him. It landed on him and took him to the ground and bit his face and his arms. And amazingly, this man wrestled with this mountain lion for 10 minutes and finally crushed its windpipe with his foot. Now, the uh, authorities and the Park Service folks who came said this man is lucky to be alive. Um, and the only thing that saved him was the fact that he heard the mountain lion in time to turn around. 
And the only reason he heard the mountain lion was because on this particular day, he decided not to wear his headphones as he ran. Now listen to what Peter says. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. There is a very real power of evil at work in this world, and it is dedicated to destroying your faith, destroying my faith, destroying our church, destroying any gospel witness in this world. It's true. In the context of 1 Peter, the people he was writing to were being persecuted for their faith. The, Satan's opposition came through people in their society pressuring them and mocking them and sometimes physically persecuting them so that they would deny Christ. And that still happens around the world. It doesn't happen to us. But Satan has many tools in his toolbox. And in the absence of persecution, he can devour us through comfort. He can ad- devour us through our obsession with, with having fun and entertainment and, and, and life being all about us. He can, def- he can def- devour us through distraction. He, you know, he tempts us to believe that there is no battle for our souls. That he's not even real. He tempts us to be apathetic about our relationship with God. Uh, I once heard a pastor from the Middle East speak to a group of college students that I was with. And he told us, having lived both in the Middle East and in the United States, he said, it is harder to be a Christian in the U.S. because life is so easy and comfortable here. It doesn't cost us anything to be a Christian, he said. It's easy to forget God. Now, I'm not saying we should seek out hardship or persecution by no means, but we have to be alert. We have to go through life with our headphones out, alert to the spiritual realities around us. Now, just as that runner in Colorado was able to hear that rustling sound and turn around, there are certain... Uh, warning bells that can alert us to Satan's activity. And I want to share a few of those with you now. Sometimes Satan comes to us as the tempter and the deceiver, making sin look harmless or even good. If you ever hear that voice that says, it's not going to hurt anyone, or nobody will, or God wants you to be happy, doesn't he? If you ever hear that voice as you're doing contemplating doing an alarm bell that satan is about to pounce and drag you into sin drag you away from god sometimes satan comes to us as an accuser that's what the name satan means accuser he says look at what you've done look at how much of a failure you are god doesn't love you What hope do you have of ever changing? If we hear that voice in our heads, that is an alarm bell that says Satan is at work. Resist him by running to Jesus in that moment and believing what is true about yourself, that you are fully loved, forgiven, accepted, and embraced in the Father's love in Christ. Sometimes, work in ways that we cannot begin to understand but we just sense a spiritual heaviness or resistance or oppression i've often found that those times come when the gospel is moving forward when people are coming to faith in jesus or growing in their faith and the enemy does not like that so in those times When there's that sense of opposition and heaviness, that's an alarm bell that says, get on your knees and pray. Resist the enemy. And we can't do any of that if we're not aware, if we're not alert, as Peter says. Now, 
this does not mean that we should be paranoid or fearful about spiritual oppression. and We, we should not call every obstacle in life spiritual warfare, as some do. But we just need to be awake and alert and sober-minded. Um, I wonder how many of my friends who have walked away from Jesus have done so because they were tempted. I know a man, a, a hero of mine, when I was growing up, who was a, a singer-songwriter, a guitar player. We, he was friends of our family, and um, he had an affair. He left his wife, moved away. Wife of 30 years, son who's 18, because Satan made that look better than faithfulness. So be alert. Well, I want to point out one more thing we need to do to stay strong in our faith, and this may be the most important of all. In verse 12, Peter writes, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. What is the this that Peter is talking about? This is the true grace of God. Well, it's everything that he has written in his letter. Everything he has described about the gospel. And he's saying, this is where you find Jesus. This is what you need to anchor your life in. In the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's think back really quickly on what Peter has written in this letter. And on what we've learned in the past few months. It starts with the impossibly good mercy of God who has, quote, given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Chapter 1, verse 3. And then Peter goes on to elaborate on how with death behind us and life before us, we can now say no to sin and yes to Jesus. Uh, he, Jesus is our cornerstone, our Savior, our example of love. And even when following him makes us look weird, even when it brings opposition or um, persecution, if it does, we continue joyfully to follow him. And we continue to love one another like Jesus. That is First Peter in a nutshell. And that's what Peter calls the true grace of God. It is the message of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, the sending of his spirit, the transformation we experience, the love of the Christian community. And it really matters, friends, to know what that is because there are so many counterfeit of the gospel out there. There are churches with a cross on the steeple and no cross in the preaching. There are famous teachers and preachers who preach with Christian language about Christian things and have no Christ in their message. Our own minds and hearts are so good at cooking up counterfeit theologies that are tailored to our desires and, and our needs and our preferences and our culture. So we need to know what the true grace of God is. I've heard that, that experts who, who can spot counterfeit currency spend most of their time not studying the fakes, but studying the genuine bills. And that enables them to spot when something is fake. And the best way for us to spot a counterfeit gospel is to know the real thing. So read your Bible, study your Bible, study it together with others. Listen to faithful Christian teachers and preachers. Grow in your faith. Know what you believe and why you believe it. And that is uh, the best protection against uh, falling away from the faith. Now, the truth is, as I've shared about what we have to do to be faithful, w there's a sense that we can't do it on our own. I mean, I know that I 
I can't be humble by myself and resist the enemy by myself and uh, keep myself from drifting from the true faith. None of us can do that. We need to be connected to a power source beyond just ourselves to stand firm in the faith. And so let me, let me show you what Peter says about that because the good news is that Peter doesn't just preach the demand but the supply. And all the power we need is available to us. I, I see in the closing of this letter two places where we find the help we need to stand firm in the faith. The first place is other people, your brothers and sisters in Christ. All of the verbs in this passage, second person plural, y'all. He's not saying you personally resist the devil, you personally stand fast. This is a group activity. Let's not miss that. In our individualistic culture, we can read these as if God is speaking directly and only to us. But he's, w- we need each other to even live out these commands. Look at verse 9 again. How can we resist the devil? Quote, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same suffering. There's solidarity. There's connectedness. The sense that we are in this together. Look at verse 12. Peter needed the help of his friend Silas to even deliver this letter so it could be read. There's dependence on one another. Verse 13. She who is in Babylon, that is the church in Rome. She meaning the church. Babylon is a code word for Rome. Chosen together with you, sends her greetings, as as does my son Mark, my spiritual son in the faith. He's reminding these Christians scattered over small towns like ours that they are part of something bigger. They are connected to others through Christ. And then he says, greet one another with a kiss of love. Now, that's not a command we can obey literally, especially during covid in our culture, we, we hug one another, we shake hands, we have warmth in our greetings. That is one of the things I miss most about pre-COVID life, coming to church, the hugs, the physical touch, that physical reminder that we are connected, we are a family in Christ. All this is to say that Christianity is a team sport, You can't begin to do it by yourself. If you've been walking for Jesus with a while, hasn't there been a time or two in your life when you've been discouraged and a brother encouraged you? Hasn't there been a time when when you were spiritually vulnerable and under attack and someone prayed for you and gave you some cover? Haven't there been times when you felt like your faith was just in tatters? And someone else came alongside you to lend you their faith for a while. Of course, all of us have experienced that. And we've all been on the the receiving and the giving end of those times. That's exactly what Christian community is designed for. We need each other. So I want to encourage you, um, whatever level of connection you have with your church family, Take it a level deeper. So if you're someone who comes to church sporadically, how about coming regularly and being with the family regularly? If you haven't yet joined a home group, consider joining a home group, going deeper. And if you are already in close relationships with Christians here, consider opening up even other parts of your life to them and going deeper still. It will only help you in your journey as a Christian and in your ability to stand firm in the faith. But Peter names another source for getting the strength we need. And uh, I'm sure you noticed it as we read. Look at verses 10 through 11 with me. And the God of all grace 
who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered for a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Who does the action of calling, restoring, and strengthening? It's not us. It's God. Who has all the power forever and ever? God. So standing firm in your faith does not look like, you know, manning up and, and showing God how strong you can be. It looks like coming to God in your frailty and relying on his strong support, his grace. And praise God for that. If not for God's grace, I would not be a Christian. I would have walked away from him long ago. I would have been tempted away from him long ago. But in God, we find the help we need to stand strong. He's the one who says, hey, load all your anxieties on me. I will carry them for you. He's the one who gives us power to resist evil. He's the one who gives us grace when we fail. There's a hymn by Keith and Kristen Getty, the authors of In Christ Alone. Uh, another hymn called He Will Hold You Fast. It says, When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. I take heart from a story of the story of a pastor, an author who has encouraged me and so many around the world. And I'll close with this. He's an unlikely hero because what he is famous for is, is actually uh, renouncing his faith early on in his career. Early on, he looked strong and capable and was leading others and doing lots of great things for Jesus. But he came to a crisis point one night with his back against the wall. He was tempted beyond what he could bear. And he renounced his relationship with Christ. He never made public what went on in his mind right after that happened. But I suspect he held on to what he had heard the Lord say to him only hours before his failure, Jesus said, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Of course, the pastor I'm talking about is the Apostle Peter. Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. What an example of God being the one that goes to bat for us to keep us in the faith. If not for Jesus doing that, maybe he would not have come back. Maybe we wouldn't even have the book of 1 Peter in our Bibles. And we all know how the story does end, how Jesus was raised from the dead and sought him out and restored him. To relationship with himself. And so I hope the time that we've spent in Peter's letter has encouraged. And in the final words of what he writes here, peace to all of you who are in Christ. Amen.